for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, Lord, we are grateful that this is uh, indeed your word, uh, inspired by your Holy Spirit, fully trustworthy, uh, without any error or defect. Uh, and so, Holy Spirit, we pray uh, that you would work in each of our hearts here today to receive this word uh, that you have inspired. Uh, would you give us faith uh, to believe it? And would you transform all of our lives uh, from the inside out, uh, that we would reflect uh, the love and the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ? And we ask this in his name. Amen. Uh, friends, will you please uh, be seated? And as you sit, uh, let me encourage you to keep your uh, bulletins, your Bibles open to that reading there from Luke chapter 6. And uh, if you're visiting this morning, welcome. Glad to have you with us. If you don't have a Bible or if you'd like to take a Bible home with you, there's some Bibles in the back. If you'd like to open up a Bible this morning, you're welcome to one of those Bibles uh, in the back of the sanctuary. Love your enemies. Turn the other cheek. Do to others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, those are impactful words, aren't they? Uh, words that have shaped many movements of, of love and peace and generosity in this world, and not just among Christians, but among non-Christians as well. Uh, you can, of course, think of someone like Gandhi, you know, as, of course, many people do when they think of the idea of turning the other cheek, though Gandhi himself wasn't a believer in Jesus as uh, the Christ, he nonetheless was quite open about how he had been powerfully impacted by Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, uh, even saying that when he first read Jesus' words about turning the other cheek, he was, quote, overjoyed to read of such an idea. And again, for many people, uh, that's true, these words strike a chord of beauty and truth and goodness. And yet, despite that, I wonder if for many people, there are words that are really just more of a dream than a reality. You know, they sound good. We nod our head and approve of them when they're read. But, but how many of us really believe that they're truly attainable? Perhaps many of us are like the group of World War II veterans who'd been horribly abused and tortured while prisoners of war in Japan in conditions that were just beyond appalling men who later came to know Christ but as they reflected on their time as prisoners of war, said, quote, We had learned from the Gospels that Jesus had his enemies just as we had ours. But there was this difference. He loved his enemies. We hated our enemies. We could see how wonderful it was that Jesus loved in this way, yet for us to do the same seemed beyond our attainment. I wonder if you can resonate with that. I certainly can uh, in fact, if we're being honest this morning, I confess I have enough trouble loving my friends, <laughs> uh, much less trying to love my enemies. I mean, the constant battle of, of selfishness and seeking my own good makes it difficult for me, frankly, to love anybody well. Uh, last week, we thought about loving our neighbors as ourselves, uh, which we said is something like the equivalent of, of crawling into someone else's skin such that with the same kind of energy and focus and uh, preoccupation that we have with ourselves, we're, we're to do that with others. Uh, we're to give the same kind of care and attention to others as we give to ourselves. And again, that's hard enough. But what we find this morning is that those others also include our enemies. And thus it's been said by many a Christian that this is the hardest command in all of Scripture. And so, brothers and sisters, what that means uh, is that we're going to need Jesus this morning. Uh, we're going to need Jesus and the gospel. We're going to need his love pulsating through our veins, transforming our hearts and remaking us into his image. And so that's my prayer for us today. And I pray that we will leave here today transformed by the radical ethic of gospel love, the very love of Jesus Christ for his enemies. So we're in Luke chapter 6 this morning. Uh, Luke's gospel doesn't contain the full Sermon on the Mount like we have in Matthew's gospel, but much of Luke 6 resonates with some of that teaching recorded in Matthew, which we looked at over the, the summer, including this command to love God. 
your enemies. Now, as we've been uh, working our way through this sermon series on love, we've been asking several questions about love. Uh, why love? How do we love? Who do we love? What is love? Well, what I want us to do this morning is to take those questions that have shaped this whole series and ask them specifically of this command to love our enemies. So in other words, let, let's try to, to ask and answer, who is an enemy? In what way are we to love our enemies? Why are we to love them? And how in the world can we possibly do this? Okay, so first this morning, who is an enemy? And who does Jesus have in mind when he commands us to love our enemies? Well, part of our answer to that comes from the immediate context of Luke 6 here. So if you have a Bible open, uh, look back at Luke 6 beginning at verse 20. <clears throat> uh, Jesus has just called the disciples to himself and immediately he begins pronouncing blessings upon those who are part of his kingdom. And so he says in, in verse 20, he says, Blessed are you who are poor... For yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. And then and listen to this one. This is verse 22. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. So, so when they treat you this way, because you belong to me, says Jesus, I'm the Son of Man, is Jesus. He goes on to say, verse 23, Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward, we're going to encounter that word again in our passage today, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. Okay, so Jesus here identifies uh, two kinds of people, we might say. Uh, those who, who suffer for his sake and are thus blessed by God. And then those who merely live for themselves and who thus will ultimately experience great woe at the end of their lives. And so the context here is one of being persecuted for the sake of Jesus. Okay, so, so this isn't persecution because we're just mean people and we treat others poorly. You no, know, this, this, is, this is persecution specifically because of the fact that we follow King Jesus. Because the reality revealed here is that there are people who hate Jesus' kingdom. There are even false prophets who try to undermine his kingdom. They don't want to see his kingdom succeed in this world. And so one of the questions then becomes, well, how do those who are blessed by God, because they're so persecuted by those who are enemies of God, how should they treat those who do that to them? Right? How do those who are blessed by God, because they're so persecuted by those who are enemies of God, how should they treat those who do that to them? Do, do, do you see that that's the context here in which Jesus speaks? And so, and so it's into that context that Jesus says to his disciples, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Okay, so, so an enemy here is someone who first and foremost is an enemy of God. And thus, in turn, is an enemy of those who love God and are part of God's kingdom in this world. And friends, the way that Jesus describes what an enemy is like here, in verse 27 onwards, well, it's really sort of breathtaking. Because here's the picture Jesus draws of an enemy in this passage today. It's a person who hates you on account of the fact that you follow Jesus. They hate you. Uh, when they think about you, they can't stand you. And so they curse you. They seek for ways to harm you. They speak words of abuse against you. They insult you. They go out of their way to make you look foolish to others. They seek to exploit you and pounce on any weakness they see in you. <clears throat> 
Right? In short, they don't want to see you flourish as a citizen of God's kingdom, and thus they'll do whatever they can to oppose you. Now, as we read and try to apply this passage here today, it's important that we first understand what all of this would have meant to Jesus' original audience in the first century. Because there's some elements here that are, that are very historically and, and culturally situated. And so we need to first understand what it would have meant to them then, and only then can we begin to apply it to ourselves today. Okay, so when Jesus here speaks to his disciples about how they should love their enemies, what he's doing for them, of course, is preparing them for the persecution that he would experience in short order, and which they would soon after begin to experience as well. And of course, if you read through something like the book of Acts, uh, which tells you the history of the early church, you, you read about these kinds of enemies who do these very things to the, to the early followers of Jesus. And so Jesus here is preparing his disciples for how they should respond when that happens. Now, for us today, maybe, maybe you see this picture that Jesus paints of an enemy here, and maybe you think, uh, I'm not really sure I have enemies like that. Uh, maybe there's some people who don't like me very much, but I don't know if anybody really hates me to this degree as Jesus describes it here. But friends, even if that's the case, right, listen, if Jesus could describe an enemy in these dramatic of terms, and, and at the same time say to his disciples, love your enemies, right, love the people who are like this and who treat you in this horrible way and who do so, not because you've done anything deserving of this, but simply because you follow me and love me, well then friends, surely you and I are called to love whatever enemy we may have, right, in whatever way they may hate us and oppose us. Uh, clearly, no person, however bad and, and mean and morally ugly, is to be excluded from our love. Okay, so you, you and I could never say of anyone who opposes us, oh, they're, they're just too much of an enemy. They're, they're just too mean and hostile. No, they're, they're just too opposed to Jesus for me to love them. Now, friends, Jesus' vivid picture here of an enemy means that no one is to be excluded from our love. So I want you to think of the person that you find it hardest to love, for whatever reason. Maybe it's the way they speak to you. Maybe it's something they stand for. Maybe it's their politics. Maybe it's the way they degrade your faith. Christian brother and sister, no one is to be excluded from your love. Love your enemies. Friends, I think you'll find this sermon to be most useful today to you if you can think very specifically of at least one person in your life who fits this category of an enemy. Who is that person for you? Second, in what way are we to love our enemies? Well, uh, Jesus doesn't give us an exhaustive list here by any means. Uh, but there are three principles, I think, that we can identify here in his teaching. Okay, one of those principles is that we're to love our enemies by treating them in the opposite way from how they wrongly treat us. Uh, look at the middle of verse 27. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. So Christian friend, if someone hates you <clears throat> because you follow Jesus, loving them will mean not just doing so passively, but, but actively seeking to do them good. Uh, this is the agape love that we've talked about throughout this series. So this is the, the kind of love that's not about what you can get, but it's about what you can give. Uh, this is the kind of love that's not based on feelings, so, so you don't have to work yourself into some kind of manufactured affection for your enemies who hate you, but you do have to love them in such a way that you actively seek to do them good. And if they curse you and curse everything you stand for, you're to speak words of blessing in response. You're to love them with your words even as they express hatred of you with theirs. And not only are you to speak words of love and blessing to them, but you'd also speak words of love to God about them. Uh, in other words, as Jesus instructs here, you're to pray for your enemies. You're to petition God for their good. They abuse you, you pray for them. 
That's to be your response. That's how you love your enemies. So again, come back to that person that you thought of just a minute ago. And consider how well you've loved them recently. Uh, what good have you done for your enemy? What could you do? Uh, what word of blessing have you spoken to them? What could you say? And what prayers of petition have you made to God for their sake? How might you pray for them even today? That's one principle. Another principle for loving our enemies here is that we're to love them by treating them with what I think can perhaps best be described as extraordinary generosity and kindness expressed through persistence and self-sacrifice. It's kind of a long way to say it, but I, I think that's what Jesus is emphasizing here. It's extraordinary generosity and kindness expressed through persistence and self-sacrifice. Look at verse 29. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. I wonder what you make of those verses. And as, you, as you look at those verses, I, I suspect that many of us would probably have to admit that our first reaction to those kind of verses is something like, really? I mean, is Jesus serious? I mean, is this kind of, is he joking? Are we really supposed to do this? Does he really expect this of us? Right, someone hits us on the, on the side of the face and we're going to go, here, here you go, get this side too. Don't forget this side of my face. Are we supposed to give all of our clothes away? We're going to run around naked? Right, someone, someone breaks into our home to, to steal our TV, we make sure that they, they don't forget the computer as well? Oh, i got a safe in the back, let me open that for you so you can get everything that I have. Is, is this what Jesus is saying? Well, again, there's some important cultural elements to this teaching here uh, that aren't familiar to us as perhaps they would have been to Jesus' first disciples. Because, again, I think what Jesus primarily has in mind here is the religious persecution that forms the, the context of this chapter, and, and particularly the persecution that the disciples were going to experience and did experience. Right? They were soon to experience those strange blessings that Jesus had just been speaking of, about being poor and hungry and weeping and having people hate you. And so again, there's a specific context to what Jesus is saying here. So for example, understand that things like being struck on the cheek and having your cloak taken, these are actions particularly related to the first century Jewish synagogue. Okay, when someone was, was thrown out of the synagogue in first century times for a supposed false teaching, uh, there would be actions that were taken that would serve as signs of judgment or, or, or rejection against them. And one symbol was being struck on the cheek. So, so before you were thrown out, you, you, you'd be slapped in the face. And this wasn't so much about the physical aspect of it, but more about the humiliation factor. Right? To have someone slap you in the face with the back of their hand was meant as a, as a tremendous insult to that person being slapped. You know, kind of like we'll, we'll kind of speak of an insult even today as being, a, that was a slap in the face to me. And then another sign of synagogue, judgment and rejection, an insult was to be stripped of your cloak. So again, for those perceived to be false teachers, this is the action that was taken against people in the synagogues. And friends, that's exactly who the disciples were perceived to be at first. They're, they were perceived to be false teachers. After Jesus' death and resurrection, they went into the synagogues proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah, the very divine Son of God Himself, the fulfillment of all the law and prophets, the one great sacrifice who's come to take away all of our sin for good. Right, that was the message they proclaimed, and in the synagogue, it was perceived to be false teaching. And so in John 16, Jesus specifically warns the disciples, they're going to hate you, and you're going to be thrown out of the synagogues. I think that's the reference here as well. Jesus is teaching the disciples how to respond when the synagogue leaders, as an act of judgment and rejection and insult, slap the disciples in the face, kick them out of the synagogue, and strip them of their cloaks. When that happens, here's what you should do, he says. 
Right? Don't retaliate. Don't run away. Instead, offer the other cheek. Now, give them your tunic as well. And if, after they've insulted you and taken your clothes, they require anything else from you, which, which I think is the idea of beg there in verse 30, right? beg, that, that, that's not about the person in the subway who's asking you for money. Right? The idea there is, is someone demanding in the context of the, of the synagogue. If they're, if they're requiring something of you, give it to them is what Jesus is saying. Or perhaps even the, the context here is something that even if your enemy is, is just trying to take advantage of you, if, if they're exploiting you because they know you're supposed to be kind in this way, well, well, just give it to them as well. And don't demand that they return any of it to you. Right? If that's what's required for the sake of really communicating the truth about Jesus to someone, then that's what the disciples were going to need to do. They would need to be willing to suffer the loss of all that they had. So you see, what Jesus is calling for here is, is indeed a kind of love that's extraordinarily generous and kind. Because it's willing, you see, to persist and sacrificially give of itself even for the good of its enemies. That's what Jesus is calling for here. Right, to, to turn the other cheek isn't about, it's not about some general notion of pacifism, as, as sometimes I think maybe we just initially hear of it. It's not about some general notion of pacifism. Rather, it's about persisting in love. It's about being willing to, to continue to be rejected and continue to have your face slapped for the sake of the gospel. Like, that's what Jesus is saying to the disciples. He's saying, don't stop speaking the gospel to your enemies, even if they treat you this way. Out of love for them, keep telling them the good news because they need it if they're going to experience the joy and happiness of my kingdom. And so when he says to them, turn the other cheek and give them your tunic as well, right, it, it's not really that that's literal, as if they're literally supposed to show them the other side of their face, and, and then they'd be fulfilling this command. No, it's a, it, it's a way of Jesus saying to them, keep going. Keep loving them. And yes, you'll expose yourself to even more rejection and to even more deprivation if you do so. I had another slap on the cheek, the taking of your tunic in addition to your cloak, the loss of even more of your stuff, but for the good of your enemies, keep telling them about me. In other words, you see, Jesus is calling on his disciples, calling on us to embody the very message of the gospel that we're proclaiming. Because, friends, the gospel is all about God's extraordinary love and kindness. And we insulted God. And we slapped God in the face. And we did so time and time again. And yet, what has God done in response? How did he treat us who were once his enemies? He didn't retaliate. He didn't run away, but instead he came to us and with extraordinary kindness and generosity, he's loved us, and persistently so. And he's turned the other cheek and turned the other cheek and turned the other cheek as we slapped him and slapped him and slapped him. He didn't give up. And so do the same, says Jesus. Love your enemies in this way. Don't give up even if it means you become vulnerable to even more rejection and more insult and more deprivation. And in fact, Jesus gives to us here another principle for the way we're to do this. And that's verse 31. Kind of summing it all up. We're to love our enemies in the very way we'd want them to treat us. In other words, the golden rule is here applied even to how we engage with our enemies. Now, we're to treat our enemies in the very way we would like to be treated, even if they keep treating us in a way that we don't want to be treated. Now, the golden rule applies even to our enemies, even to those who hate us and seek us harm. So, love your enemies in the opposite way that they wrongly treat you. Love them by showing them extraordinary generosity and kindness expressed through persistence and self-sacrifice. 
and love them by treating them in the way that you would like to be treated. Now, what would this look like for us today? Uh, None of us, I assume, are being kicked out of the synagogues. Uh, The rejection that Christians in this country maybe receive isn't quite as blatant as that, if we receive any rejection, perhaps. It may be instead something like coming in the form of being ostracized in certain social circles. Maybe it's uh, economic deprivation of some sort. Maybe a job withheld. Maybe it's a, a teaching position withheld. But friends, whatever form in which it comes, the application is still, it's the same. It's it's persist in love. Do good, bless, pray, and love your enemies enough to keep preaching the gospel. Be willing to be insulted for it. Be willing to receive whatever deprivation comes from sharing with people the one hope of life and salvation for all human beings, the good news of Jesus Christ. And that leads us to a third question this morning. Why? Why? Why love these enemies in this way? Well, as I was just saying, it's connected to the hope of the gospel. Uh, There's only one way to be saved, and that's for someone to put their faith in Jesus. And so the reason why we persist with this kind of love, even of our enemies, is because we want them to be saved. Uh, We want them to, to see in us the very embodiment of this message that we're proclaiming. And I think that becomes even more clear as Jesus goes on here in verse 32. Look at verse 32. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies. And do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Okay, so why do we love this way? Well, for one, there's a great reward. Uh, is the very reward of the blessing of God's kingdom, of which Jesus spoke earlier. But the greater reason is because when we love like this, as Jesus says here, we'll, we'll be sons of the Most High. Uh, in other words, we'll reflect the image of our Heavenly Father and, and thus get to show people what God is really like. Right? Because God is loving and merciful. Friend, have you ever stopped to consider just how merciful God really is? Right? Even to those who hate him, God continues to give them life and breath. He continues to cause the sun to come up every day. He continues to provide food for the earth. And of all of the billions of people in the world, how many of them do you think wake up every day and thank God for his kindness to them? I wonder how many of us in this room woke up this morning and gave thanks to God for his kindness to us. And yet he continues to be kind to the ungrateful and the evil. And Christian friend, to you who who have come to know Jesus, I mean, think think of the mercies of God that you can now proclaim, that you've personally experienced in the forgiveness that you have in Jesus. I mean, they're innumerable, aren't they? Has God not been so merciful to you? And, And did you deserve any of it? Of course not. And so you see, as his children, he now wants us to do the same for our enemies. He wants us to be merciful as he is merciful. And so when it comes to doing good, and even when it comes to our money and helping those in need, this reality of God's kindness and mercy and love is to shape what we do. Because as Jesus says here, there's nothing unique about loving those who love you. I mean, the, 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 the whole fallen world operates on that very principle. right? You treat me well, then I'll treat you well. You scratch my back, I'll I'll scratch yours. But friends, what makes the gospel so unique is that it's all about love for enemies. God loving us, his enemies. Just go back to Romans 5 that we looked at a few weeks ago. While we were sinners, while we were enemies, Christ died for us. I mean, the whole gospel is about God mercifully loving his enemies in Jesus Christ. And as a result, us now who are his children... Loving our enemies and loving those who can't repay us. 
Right? And why? Because again, in doing so, we become the very embodiment of the gospel we're proclaiming. And friends, when that happens, the result is that our enemies may be saved through that. Right? When we're hated and yet we persistently and generously love like God has loved us, then in the face of more love, yes, some people will they'll grow even angrier. It certainly happened to Jesus. Jesus loved and he loved and he loved and, and people got angrier and they put him to death. But some people were saved through that. When we continue to love even in the face of anger and hatred, some people will be won over by that. That's what an extraordinary radical love like this can do. It can break down hard hearts. It can ultimately soften hearts for the gospel. And so in the way that we treat our enemies, again, we want to embody the very gospel that we're proclaiming so that people might ultimately come to love the God who loves his enemies. The God who loves those who can never pay him back. Uh, we want people to know that God. That's why we're to love like this. So friends, let me ask you, how does all that sound to you? Does it sound difficult? Does it sound like the hardest command ever? Does it sound impossible? Well, that's our final question this morning. How in the world can we possibly love these kinds of enemies in these kinds of ways for this purpose? Here's a short answer to that question. You can't. You can't do it. You don't do it. The call here is for such a radical love that no person, no matter how well-intentioned, no matter how much they may rejoice at the idea of turning the other cheek, no person can live out this radical kind of love. And therefore, God's law judges each of us here. Each of us has fallen short of this kind of love. We have not loved our enemies in this way. We, we are guilty of not loving in the way that Jesus commands us to do. But again, the message of the gospel is that Christ has done this for us. He's loved his enemies perfectly. Remember, the historical context is Jesus preparing his disciples for the persecution that they're, they're going to soon encounter. But don't forget that before they underwent this kind of treatment, Jesus first experienced it himself. And throughout it all, he loved his enemies. He was hated. People plotted his death. They spat at him. They cursed him. They called him names. They, they questioned his identity. They, they accused him to be in league with Satan. He was abused. He was tortured. He was literally struck on the cheek. Uh, he was literally stripped of all his clothes. They literally took every material thing from him. And yet, what did he do? He didn't call down curses on them. He didn't spit back. He didn't run from what they were doing. No, he gave himself up for their good so that they could be saved. And even when they mocked him on that cross, saying things like, if you're really the king of the Jews, save yourself. Come down from that cross. He continued to hang there out of love. For they completely missed the fact that it was precisely because he didn't save himself that he was able to save them from their sins by dying in their place for them. And thus, even as he hung on that cross, he spoke a word of blessing and prayer for his persecutors. Father, forgive them. So friends, no, we, we, we can't love in this way. We don't love in this way. But Jesus has, and he does, he loves his enemies and he invites every one of them to come to him and be saved. Friend, have you ever done that? No matter the horrible things that you've done to him, repent of your sin, put your faith in him, and he will receive you and love you forever. And Christian friends, when we come to Christ, listen, a miracle happens. A miracle happens because what happens is that Jesus begins to change us so that we can learn, however slowly, however inconsistently it may be, we can learn to love our enemies in this radical way. Uh, listen to how Peter puts it in 1 Peter 2. 
Peter wonderfully brings together the fact that Jesus has done this for us and he gives us an example for us to follow. Peter writes, if when you do good and suffer for it you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him, God, who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So friends, we couldn't do this, but Christ did it for us to return us to our shepherd and then to teach us and empower us to do the same. And so now it's, it's, it, it's no longer impossible for us to do so. It's still difficult. It's still the hardest command there is. But by God's grace, in the power of the Holy Spirit, like our Father in heaven, and like Jesus our Savior, we can begin to love our enemies in this way. And indeed, this is precisely what happened to someone like Louis Zamperini. I don't know if you know his story. It's a story of the way that God's love and grace can transform us so that we begin to love like God loves. Uh, Louis Zamperini's story is told in the book Unbroken. Uh, like the group of veterans that I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, Zam Zamperini too, he was a, a veteran of World War II. He too had been a prisoner of war. Uh, he too had experienced brutal treatment in the most horrible conditions beyond even what you can imagine. And there was one man in particular nicknamed The Bird, who so abused Zamperini. And after the war, Louis Zamperini he was released, he was able to come back to the United States, but he, he was filled with, with such hatred for this man. He had nightmares about him. Now, he had dreams about hunting him down and murdering him. He, he couldn't sleep, he was filled with rage. He gave himself to alcohol to try and numb the pain and hatred that he felt. And then one evening, living in California, he was reluctantly brought along to a Billy Graham crusade. And what happened that night was nothing short of a miracle. With every fiber of his being, he tried to resist the gospel that was being proclaimed to him about a God who loved him and would forgive him and bless him for eternity. He even tried to literally run out of that revival tent before he could make it. The Lord grabbed hold of his heart and Zamperini put his faith in Christ and his life was forever changed. He was, in his own words, quote, a new creation, changed by the gospel of God's love and mercy. And he would never again have a nightmare about his tormentor, nor a dream about putting his tormentor to death. In 1950, a year after his conversion, he returned to Japan to visit one of the prisons where he had been kept and so mistreated. And as he did so, he looked for the man who had been his tormentor, only to learn that the man had recently died. Now, reading here now from the story told in the book about his life, in Sagamo Prison, as he was told of the bird's fate, his great enemy, all Louis saw now was a lost person, a life now beyond redemption. He felt something that he had never felt for his captor before. With a shiver of amazement, he realized that it was compassion. At that moment, something shifted sweetly inside him. It was forgiveness, beautiful and effortless and complete. Before Louis left Sagamo, the colonel who was attending him asked Louis's former guards to come forward. In the back room, the former guards who had abused him and mistreated him stood up and shuffled into the aisle. They moved hesitantly, looking up at Louis with small faces. Louis was seized by childlike, giddy exuberance. Before he realized what he was doing, he was bounding down the aisle. In bewilderment, the men who had abused him watched him come to them, his hands extended, a radiant smile on his face. Friends, whether it's loving our enemies in this way, those who so have it out for you and hate you and have mistreated you, and yet you show compassion and forgiveness to them, or whether it's, it's loving them like the, the mission, missionary Adoniram Judson did, or Judson's story, 
that we learned about at our last Global Missions Week. Uh, Judson, Judson endured prison specifically because he was a Christian missionary, and yet he so loved his captors that he, he actually won observers over because of the love that he showed. Or whether it's the love of, of Joseph, the, the Maasai warrior whose story I shared with you last spring, who, who was converted to the Lord, and he went back to his remote East African village trying to share the gospel with the people in his village, and every time that he did so, though, he was regularly beaten to within an inch of his life. And yet in love he persisted. And he persisted. And he persisted. He turned the other cheek. He turned the other cheek. He turned the other cheek. Until his whole village was one for Christ. Friends, to, to love our enemies. Now, we can't do it. Not in our own strength. But Christ has done it for us. Loving us, his enemies. And in his strength, we can now begin to do the same. We learn and are empowered to love from the very place that we have received such love. And that's the cross of Jesus Christ. So Christian friend, who are the enemies that God is calling you to love? Will you show them the love of God in Christ? Let's take a few moments to pray. I invite you to pray on your own. You might take some time to thank God for showing you love and mercy. You might ask Him for help to love those who are perhaps mistreating you right now. Let's take a few moments in quiet prayer. Uh, Lord, we praise you uh, this morning for your grace and your mercy to us. Lord, would you help us, we pray, to embody the great truth of the gospel. And please help us to love like you love. And Father, would you set the glory and the hope of your eternal kingdom before us that we'd be willing to lose everything in this world as we proclaim Christ knowing that you have promised to give us your very kingdom. And Lord, we pray for our enemies. We ask that you would bless them by softening their hearts to your love, that they might be saved from their sins and reconciled to you. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.